Welcome to Facebook Live and to Scale Up Heroes. We're up to episode seven, and we're glad that you're with us. Welcome to the show. We bring the best minds with the best real life experiences when it comes to scaling up businesses. These are the heroes that took on the difficult odds and are living to tell the tale. I'm your host, Randy Cantrell, and to all of our viewers, we want to invite you to visit our website, scaleupacademy.io. Today, we're discussing scaling up product. So now let me bring in our moderator for today, Alex Lenowich. Alex is the head of product at Yodel. He's based in Berlin. Welcome. Thanks, Randy, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad uh, I have the opportunity to moderate this uh, round here. Um, I'm always excited, you know, to talk about product stuff. So let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm leading now Yodel, the product at Yodel, uh, for around four years. So what we are trying to do is, you know, we believe there's a need in local communication and we try to connect you, you know, to the community around. And how are we doing it? We are developing an app, a uh, social media app, which has two main differences compared to you know, all other social medias which are currently out there. The first thing is, you know, we don't connect you to your social graph of family and friends. We connect you through the people around you. And the other huge difference is that, <clears throat> you know, you don't require a profile. So we believe social media became more of like your private PR agency. And uh, yeah, we want to, you know, create a more authentic environment. So that's what we do uh, now for around four years. Uh, the stage of the company is, uh, you know, we are around 40 people and we raised last year a series A. So just for you, like um, as a background, I would like, you know, to discuss with uh, the other panelists today, like mostly three topics. Number one, you know, like product teams and how they are structured then a bit into product process, how to decide what to work on correctly. And the last one about product culture and mindset. Uh, but first, uh, I would like uh, you know, the panelists to introduce uh, themselves. Maybe you can mention a bit about yourself, the company, and most important, uh, you know, the product you're working on. So uh, yeah, Max, why would you, why, would you start, please? Definitely take, yeah. Um, my name is Max Victor, and uh, thank you, Alexander, for, for the intro and being the moderator today. And thank you to Mike from Scale Up Academy, and of course, uh, Randy for being our host today. So, I'm head of design at uh, Beacon. Uh, we help companies make their employees more engaged so they don't quit their job. That's the easiest way of saying it. Um, I've been there for three years with the Flow First employee. Um, so, we're obviously really design focused, um, and it's been a main focus for us to create a great intuitive interface since day one. So. Um, Hopefully, I don't know as much about scaling the entire product team, but I've been there for the whole process and I can talk about scaling the design team and specifically. Um, so thank you again. Geoffrey, I think you're muted. Yes. I <laughs> Hello, thank you uh, for getting me here. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share my experience and knowledge with you guys. Uh, I've worked in many companies uh, before, uh, going to IBAN first, uh, retail and software companies, always as a product owner. Today, I'm head of product at IBAN first, which is a payment establishment specialized in uh, foreign currencies payments, so for international companies. And um, IBAN first is very known in France and soon in Europe for uh, developing its own core banking system, which enable us to really uh, manage and uh, have a full, um, how can I say that, have a full uh, control over the payment system and getting the payment fast and quick, uh, as quickly as possible, which is very important for companies today. Yeah, thank you really much for the introduction, Max and Joffrey. So, uh, yeah, I, I would like to jump into what uh, I think, you know, is most important for like a good product. It's like, you know, successful product team. Uh, maybe, Joffrey, you can start and give us some insights and, you know, 
how how many product teams do you have at Ivan first, and how are they structured? You know, what what roles are included? Uh, today, Ivan first is pretty small. Uh, we have only only four product manager, including me, as well as uh, 15 developers. And uh, what we did is we tried to uh, to uh, organize a team uh, in swim lanes. So I think it depends on the business, of course, but at Iban first, we have two core systems. We have the platform for customers and we have the back office for uh, middle office. So one team is working only for the customers uh, closely with sales and customer team. Uh, and they focus on user experience and uh, uh, focus on the customer pains, whereas the other team is uh, working on all internal use. So it's middle office, payment clearing, risk management, QIC. Uh, compared to the customer team, they have a deep knowledge of the, of the system, how the payment works with our partners, and their main focus is to scale the business and uh, the operations. So um, usually all projects uh, impact both teams. So we might think it's not very efficient because they, they work together a lot, but it's very, it makes easier to align the teams together. And uh, so when we work on a project, we have middle office and customers, they both work on, the, on their uh, project and then they, they meet together and try to connect the dots. Uh, and it enables to create customer, um, great customer features, which is operationally direct uh, at uh, day one, scalable and works well. Max, what, what, so it's interesting because like you, you now like as a designer coming from another approach, like are the designers integrated in your uh, product teams uh, at PCON? Yeah, so just to, to start one, one uh, some, somewhere, uh, we started just in one product team, of course, with one that many people, and then recently we switched over to having uh, three product teams. Um, we believe a lot in um, in specialization, but also we talk about having like T-shaped people, so having one one core competency and then spreading out into other competencies as well. Um, for us, this also goes for what you actually work on. So because we have three three product te teams, we try to work on three themes every quarter um, and then giving people some level of, um, of choice about what they want to work on this quarter. So as a designer, of course, it makes sense that you are deep in one area of the product, but also have the opportunity to go into all areas of the product. Uh, I think we all know the feeling of being tired of working on the same thing for, for years and years, and we definitely don't want to burn out people. So um, yeah, that's the kind of general approach that we take. I'm personally also interested, like, uh, you know, we recently, we had like a change from, you know, back in the early days, uh, we used to work into like, okay, we have an iOS team, we have an Android team, but we kind of transferred like a bit like inspired by like, you know, the, the Spotify approach of, I don't know if you saw it, like the, 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 the squads and guild system, which we have basically, and uh, it's like, for the first time, we changed our teams now, like one and a half year ago, to uh, you know more that we have cross-functional teams. Uh, which roles are you covering, uh, Geoffrey? Like, do do you have like uh, is every product team looking the same in the four of you, or like uh, yeah, maybe you can give a bit of insight of like what's like the size and what roles are included in the team. Okay, so uh, each product team, I think the squad is a good word actually, uh, is composed of, uh, so today we have two product manager, but they all have their own teams, uh, three developers, and uh, we don't have any designer in the company. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, what is important is that in the team taking care of all the customer experience, of course, design is a key. And uh, we have a former uh, UX designer who is today a project manager at a product manager at Event First, and uh, we try to get as different profile as possible. In the core system team, uh, we have uh, engineers, so they don't know uh, well about technique, but they do, they are very good at uh, algorithm, uh, excelling stuff, and so on. 
and on the customer team, it's more uh, UX uh, experience profile. Um, but uh, regarding your discussion about uh, do we have a team for an app, the team for the web app, and so on, uh, because today uh, our tech teams are working with microservices that can be pushed to any uh, device, the team are working uh, across devices. So the team in charge of customers is working on the app, on the web app, uh, and uh, and the team uh, on the core system is only working on the on the web app because there is no uh, mobile app for the internal guys. Do, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. I think uh, I'm always like you know excited into you know looking into into other product teams like because it's like you see quite differences. Like Mats, what what would you say like what what roles have you covered in your product team? Yeah, so so actually we 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 create more like product a project product team. So we take the people that we need for for that team at a time. So. We're building a new product now, um, so we need some uh, like mobile development skills. So we'll take that from some of the other pro uh, projects or other teams. Um, of course, there is like some stuff that you are very good at. It is hard moving around. So we have one team in general that's scaling our service. So as we onboard more customers, we need to scale our service, and we have one guy that's like the server guy, right? And it, of course, it's hard to bring him onto something else for for too long of a time. Um, speaking of the, the design role, um, we have three designers right now and are hiring the fourth. Um, the, the, it depends on which kind of designer it is, but in general, uh, design is, of course, a part of the whole process and what are we building, why are we building it, uh, validating with customers together with the PM. Um, and then depending on what kind of designer it is, it could be more UI focused, so how does it look, or more UX focused, so how does it work. Um, and if the designer is less good at, uh, at UX, for example, so the user experience, then of course the PM or the UX designer can, can help that person more, right? But yeah, it fills in that <clears throat> early part of the project, figuring out exactly what, what do we do? And then of course, in the, in the end of the project, so how does it look as well? Um, but yeah, it follows the team, the, 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 whole, the whole sprint. I, I like it, especially like the, the last part, which you said, Mats, because, you know, if I look at the, you know, whole product process, like I like to think of it as, you know, first part, you know, as discovery and then like the second one, delivery. Um, it's actually like, you know, a good, uh, good introduction, like to the, to the next question I wanted to ask. And it's like, if you're right now, like into the stage to, you know, to do the, this discovery work, you know, um, how would you say, you know, how do you decide what to work on? When is like the moment when you said, ah, okay, this idea, I need to build this, like, oh, we need to build this. Maybe, yeah, maybe okay, I can continue, Matt. Yeah, I guess I will that. So the, the way that we actually work is that we, um, we get a lot of inputs, of course, for all our, all our customers and, and prospects, right? So we have an app in the, a uh, system called Podio where all employees of the company uh, are incentivized to add, and add any product inputs. That could be uh, what customer says, your own ideas. It could also be, uh, of course, competitors. And then we try as a like management and product team to distill what are the overall ideas, try to write them down into to Apex somehow, like what are the core ideas, what are the themes that seem to come up, up and, uh, come up again and again. Um, and then we then, because we go on a, a quarterly offsite with the entire company, um, before then we have tried to set up these core themes of stuff that we believe that we should work on for the next quarter. Um, and of course, below that, there are some things that are obvious that we should do, um, but also things that are not obvious yet. And we try to, to let that team has, have some uh, like decision making themselves on what to actually work on. Of course, uh, we just onboarded some large customers. We need to scale the service. Those things we need to do, but are also things that uh, are not must-haves to scale the service. And then the team itself can have some determination over what to actually work on. And we seem to find like that works really well. Like like people don't like to be told just you have to work on this for the for the next quarter. Like, the idea that you can actually have some some impact on on the product uh, is we find is very important to keep people motivated and also. To get fresh ideas, because how the fuck would, would I know to get up with two other people what to work on? Uh, you need to get everybody's ideas in there and distill them down. 
Thanks, Mats. Uh, yeah, Geoffrey, like you have like a bit of a different product, but uh, yeah, like how, how are you guys deciding uh, what to work on? Like, do you get also a lot of feedback from users? <clears throat> yes, uh, yes. As a fintech, we already have the roadmap for the next two years, I would say, because we know what we need to get our customers happy. Um, I will say the official uh, answer is we use the roadmap. Uh, we get feedbacks from customers, uh, sales. Uh, we try to do as many uh, presentations as we can outside our uh, um, our ecosystem to get feedbacks on what people are uh, waiting. And then we we organize them uh, based on clear rules that are shared across all departments. It's uh, business opportunities, risk of losing business as well. If we don't push a feature to, uh, if we take too, uh, too much time to push a feature, compliance because it's very legal in fintech and uh, scalability and um, once we have this we do uh, uh, bi-weekly meetings actually on the roadmap with all departments and we align everyone on what are the next what is the project for the next month and the near future so the three months um, and based on that Therefore, it uh, enables us to avoid people from pushing their projects uh, on the side uh, because this is something that happens a lot. And uh, we try to align as many people as possible uh, at the department level or the top managers. So we make sure uh, uh, the product team uh, knows what it has to do and people are using their time for things that matters. Uh, now the reality is that uh, sometimes uh, there is great ideas from the C from the CEOs coming and say I want to do personalized IBAN, uh, and we say okay for the business we don't know what it is, and then it's I, I will call it free time. We have 20% free time in our week, and uh, we work on it for doing projects that we believe are good. We discuss it together, and uh, and uh, once we have uh, at least. Uh, when through the discovery phase, maybe it will uh, get higher in the roadmap. That's, uh, that's quite interesting. I would, um, especially the last point you mentioned uh, regarding, I mean, you, you meant or mentioned a lot about like alignment through objectives, uh, Geoffrey. Um, I would also personally be interested, like how uh, I you, like if you, if you like the balance between you know the output we need to generate. You mentioned like some features you already yes. know you want to do versus okay, there's a certain outcome, you know, and giving the possibility, you know, to you know like to the product team itself to you know maybe come up with something else. Like how how would you say like what what's the balance? Like or how do you approach uh, this issue like is it more that you have already clear things in mind or it's like more openly so that like there's like flexibility to when someone is finding something out on the way that you can use it to uh, include it in your solution yes uh, something in important at iban first uh, is that uh, we don't have a product culture uh, it's more a sales culture we are here to sell so uh, I would say that the ratio is is we are more organized and the things we want to do because we think it's fun or we believe it it could be a, a good silver bullet as we like to say uh, is is really not so much uh, but uh, when we work on a project and I think it shows how we work we, we usually have three phases uh, when we, we start with the MVP and the MVP really it's one goal we solve a problem we don't care about UX, uh, we just want to solve the problem. And uh, when we have done that, then we say, okay, we should improve the usability and the design if the product uh, gets attention from our customers, but they are not using it. Um, and then the extra value, the, the things I think product manager loves to do uh, is the last thing we do, actually. So making something fun and delightful, even if the subject uh, payments is very serious, it doesn't mean we don't have to be uh, fun. Uh, and I think it's also true when you prioritize a project, you have fun projects and projects that are less fun, but to be honest, yeah, we focus on what's uh, important for the company, uh, business-wise and uh, KPY-wise. KPY 
Mats, what would you say? Like, what what would be like important to uh, to create like a, you know like a product culture? You know, what uh, you know could be sometimes a bit challenging. You know, if you have also like like Geoffrey said, like uh, um, a huge you know need of like sales. Like, what would you say is important to you know create a product culture? Yeah. So we were quite fortunate that we that we raised a bit of money when, when the company started. Um, so for the first year, and this wasn't because we didn't try to sell, we we're just very bad at it. We didn't sell anything. Right. But it also it really allowed us to dip deep, dig deep into the product. It was also like a market, like, like employee engagement uh, as a SaaS model wasn't really made yet. And there wasn't any like real competitors on the market that really had nailed the model for everything. So we spent a lot of time figuring out actually, how do you do this thing? And one of our mantras was like, don't look at a competition. Um, and for a long time, it's because we didn't have any customers. Like it was very product driven naturally. We can only try to guess why we didn't win any deals and why we couldn't get 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 any customers. Um, so then the biggest change has been like, how do you maintain a product culture as you hire a lot of salespeople? Because like sales is definitely the biggest team within, within our company. Um, and how do you, make make salespeople understand that we make certain choices because they're right on the long term and not on the short term. And that's the hard thing. Um, and I think it, we had a hard time in the beginning as we were onboarding a lot of salespeople, like getting that message through. Like, So why, for example, don't we just allow old companies to ask any question that they like? Um, and then and in the beginning, you know, like our argument was like, because in the long run, this, this will be better. We'll have the data model structured. We can do predictive analytics and all these things, but we didn't, we haven't showed anything yet. It was just like the idea that we might be able to do that one day. Um, and it wasn't until like maybe a year in of hiring salespeople. So the second year um, that we could really show like these features, uh, we're the only ones building them um, and you're winning deals on these things. And now that's a part of the company's culture, like, like history. So now we do like when no, new salespeople comes on and like, that is why product know, knows what they're doing. Um, because they can see the future, right? Um, on the other hand, of course, we are also a lot more open now these days with getting feedback and inputs from from sales because they are the people uh, on the front lines. Um, one giving us money so we can continue running the company, but also getting a lot of great feedback from our from our partners. Um, so definitely, um, it's a bit of give and take. If I can add something, Alex. Sure. Because I arrived at Tibad first one year ago, and at that time it was definitely sales who were uh, ruling the, the the business and the company, and the product was a support team actually, only supporting what sales needs. And uh, what we tried to do to make it less sales is uh, first we consult them more clearly, and by consulting them we get a lot of ideas and say no to them. Uh, make them uh, understand that uh, we can control what we do and they need to trust us on the yeah on the path we go and um, and so the, I think the feedback loop at Iban first at least is very important because sales are um, understanding we listen to them but then we need to make decisions because if they look at the roadmap they will uh, They will leave the room and they're okay. Have fun. I don't understand what you want to do. Too many stuff. And uh, yeah, it's important to uh, to work with them um, and share the success and uh, share what we do, where we go, and uh, try to get them in our head as much as possible. It's like you you guys made like I'm a bit frightened because like we so far. Uh, we don't have like a sales team in-house. So like for the, you know, the social media model is basically based on growth. We are um, trying to engineer right now, like our network effect so that, you know, the base of it, it will be like an ads model. So we need before like, uh, you know, people to, to use it. And uh, yeah, we are still luckily that, you know, so far, Uh, we were super focused on product only. We, we developed like first ads feature to monetize on, but like we, we clearly said like, okay, uh, to not distract ourselves, like we will outsource it. So we have right now actually like outsourced sales. And uh, yeah, like it was quite interesting for me to, to see that, you know, when sales kicks in, that's actually uh, a huge challenge. 
Um, what I was mo also really interested to think both of you said, it's like, okay, communicating, uh, you know, with sales and like show them also the impact of what product has. So um, I would be interested, uh, maybe Geoffrey, what, what, you know, how are you measuring impact or what, what are the things when you go to the sales team and, and show them? Sorry, can you uh, ask back the question? I'm not sure. Yeah, how, 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 how are you measuring the impact in the end? So, um, you know, product is working on something. Um, how are you measuring this impact? And yeah, what, what yeah. Is, yeah. So uh, aside from the basic data, how much revenue uh, is uh, making a product, um, how much uh, things like that, what we do is that when a customer has something we don't have, uh, we usually uh, put that on side. And when the feature is released, we see how people are using back the features they were requested. And um, and we try also to perform a lot of uh, in-app um, questions to ask customers how they prefer this and so on. Uh, we are in a market uh, foreign exchange. Uh, beside from uh, the basic uh, company, you know, Revolut, TransferWise is very, very, very old school. And uh, people are today calling us to do the payments. So um, it's very difficult to have a clear uh, measurement. So the best we can do is to follow up how the product is doing and uh, if the, we have more onboardings and also we get the feedback from the sales themselves, um, we have uh, the chance to be next to them and discuss with them all the time uh, and get to know more. But scaling the feedback without KPI is pretty difficult, I guess. What about you, Mats? Like, what, what does like, impact mean for, for, your, for, for your product team? So it depends on like really strategic goals that we are working towards and on whether it's like a product, like an all over product changing thing, or it's like a feature that we want to improve because it's a, it's a KPI. So I can tell you about a story about something that we just worked on uh, last quarter. Um, so we can see that uh, like the response rates of the service we're sending out is good. We want to make sure that it continues being good. So if we don't get data in, we don't get good, good insights and uh, our customers will, will go away. Um, we are so lucky that we got like a great team of data scientists that can help set setting up all these tests. So the first thing we did with that was to sit down and figure out, okay, um, when are people stop stopping to answer the survey, and uh, when can we then go in and and make an impact so they start again? And then, of course, they they can help us run these uh, these tests. That's very like specific on a on a certain feature. Uh, on an outcome basis, and uh, there's multiple things. So. Um, at a certain point, uh, we weren't winning all the requests for, for proposals, so all the deals we were invited to, we weren't winning all of them, which we are close to now. Um, and we can see that we were missing some features in that, right? So, of course, we need, if you lose one, it's no big deal. If you, if you lose a couple, it's, it's maybe not so good. And if you lose more, it's kind of like a pattern. So, and then we can see, okay, what do we need to build to start winning these deals? Because it's a, it's a B2B like SaaS product, right? Um, and then it's very easy to measure impact. So we build it and now we're winning the deals, which is <laughs> very, very easy. Um, another thing uh, it's probably too advanced to go into is like, uh, if you're selling a SaaS product, you have like stuff like plan differentiation. So it's the stuff that we can, we can build. Um, so certain plans uh, seem more valuable and are more valuable to people who pay more. And then you can measure the impact of, how many people are we moving upwards in, in the plans that they're paying for? But I think that's a <laughs> separate discussion. Uh, do, is there like any specific tools you use for that? For like all your KPIs measurements, like what tools are you using? Uh, um, so it's, 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 it's uh, different, different stuff. So a lot of like tracking on our users, we can't do because uh, GDPR and, and <laughs> like retaining user data, um, but so we can we can look in like aggregated data in our database and stuff like that. But stuff like uh, let's say like heat mapping of the website when people are using it, uh, we're not allowed to do. Um, but of course, we can do some click tracking and we can don't retain the user data. Um, we can look at like whether features used or not. We can get that out of a database and stuff like that. Um, 
but it's 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 homegrown stuff for the most for the most part. Um, and then of course like Google Analytics for for larger stuff. Nice. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the insights. Like, you know, to to round this up, I would like to know, uh, you know, from both of you, what was like the single biggest learning, you know, in your product career so far? I think, you know, uh, both of you are really experienced like product guys and you probably went through, you know, like a lot of learning. So I would be interested, Geoffrey, like, what is it like? The, what would you consider like the biggest one? It's a difficult question. Uh, product manager is uh, usually uh, making decisions with uh, imperfect information. Uh, they usually uh, have to deploy stuff without being uh, manager of the people they need to work on. And for me, the biggest learning is that it's maybe basic, but uh, product team and developers uh, need to work very closely together. I've uh, I've been in t in um, in companies where the development teams is uh, outsourced, outsourced, and uh, we can see that uh, there is a big change on your product uh, if you work closely with the team and you have a good uh, relationship. And basically, if you don't have this, your product is dead before it's live. Matt, what think, yeah, yeah. Think for for us, and this is quite interesting. Um, so. We just raised our a Series B, which is like $22 million. So normally you would have a lot of developers and a lot of designers and a huge product team. I think the biggest learning for me is that if you spend a lot of time hiring um, and hire very good people, doesn't have to be senior, goes with people with like a lot of potential in them, um, then you don't need as many people. And 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 you kind of know this, that if you like, if you throw three more engineers on the problem, it's not going to go three times faster. Um, but we can see like talking to investors through time, they were like, so how many people are you again? Like, you, like how, how are you building all these things for so few people? And I think that's, that's like a great learning that like, it's about having the best people you can get, um, having them trust each other immensely. Um, I think that allows us to speed up a lot. Like if a, a developer comes back to me and say like, if you do it this way, it's not faster. I believe that that is the best way to do He's not just like trying to go home early that day. He, like he, that's actually the best like course of action. And the other way around, if I push something through, they know that that's for the best. So like hiring the best people and like and allows you to go so much faster. And having that trust between people is so important. Uh, yeah. Would, would would you say like some kind of like restrictions, like having you know maybe like. You know, in in our career so far, we had we faced like um, you know situations where you know it was like a bit like time pressure or like not so much money or like people level like some there was some kind of restriction there. But I had like uh, you know if I look back and I always the feeling that this helped actually a bit. You know, because you started to think in a in a in a different way compared to like okay. You have all the resources you need, like you have all the money, like it's, it's kind of making like what I found out for myself, like it's always good to have some kind of restrictions because it's like starting, you start to think more creative and uh, compared to, or you're getting too, a bit too lazy if you have like to spend your resources. Would you agree on that? Or? Yeah, 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 I agree. Like, like Again, like when you have fewer people as, as we were for a long time, when we could hire more, um, uh, did, I, did I drop out? Uh, I think I dropped out. Sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> you can hear me? Yeah. 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 So, so I think uh, we also like a, 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 like quite a few, like a small group. Um, we could have maybe hired more, but uh, like giving it to that few people, making us like trust each other and then pushing out like few features for the right features was very important to us. and in the beginning and still is. And then like a second thing, right? I didn't mention this. Now we are employee engagement company. So treating your people right is one of the most important things. So like uh, we have almost no people leaving us, um, which of course makes the consistency in the product team very high and you don't have to spend so much time on onboarding new people all the time. Of course now we do because we hire a lot of people, but it's not because people are leaving. Uh, like handing over shitty code because they want to get to a new place. It's, I think that's been very important for us to have like a group that we've just been learning each other better and better um, over the last three years. So when people start, they 
they stay. So yeah. that, that has been great. Awesome. Uh, th thank you really much for, for your answer, Mats. Also, Geoffrey, uh, like was really interesting to, to have this discussion, you know, covered a lot of different topics from like teams, process, like mindsets. Um, it's always super exciting to, you know, to dive into other companies uh, and yeah, to get the insight. So thank you really much. Uh, really enjoyed it and yeah Randy I would uh, give the word back to you well thanks guys uh, and thanks to our audience here on Facebook live for watching this episode of scale up heroes and a special thanks to all of our panelists today and to you Alex uh, for moderating visit our page at scaleupacademy.io if you want to learn more about us and if you find these shows valuable we hope that you'll hit that like button and share today's show I'm your host, Randy Cantrell, and I hope that next week you'll join us when we're going to have a CEO roundtable discussion about scaling up in general uh, with these top leaders. See you next week.